Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome. This is a press conference from the Standing Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology. Um, speaking today is Senator Radna Om Omidvard, who's chair of the committee, Senator Stan Kucher, and Senator Patrick Brazo. And with that, I will pass it over to the speakers. Good morning. Doing what works. That's the title of the report we are here to discuss. It could have easily been called doing what doesn't work because the federal framework for suicide prevention is failing by the only metric that really matters, lives saved. Politics is often said to be a blood sport. Crises described as matters of life and death. Usually this is hyperbole, not so today. Updating our suicide pre prevention framework truly is a matter of life and death. And we are to here to explain to you why. My name is Senator Ratna Omidvar. I am an independent senator from Ontario and the chair of the Senate Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology. Here with me are two senators with profound insights into the issues of suicide and suicide prevention. Senator Stan Kutcher is a psychiatrist and professor who has helped countless young people navigate major mental illnesses. Senator Patrick Brazo has publicly acknowledged his own struggles with mental health while giving indigenous people a powerful voice in parliament. His bravery in speaking so openly about his experiences is matched only by his commitment to making sure that people in need can find support during their darkest hours. Over the next few minutes, I will provide you with a brief overview of the report. Senator Kutcher will then get into some of the recommendations and share his perspectives as a clinician and a researcher. Senator Brazo will then share some of his own experience and insights. And after that, we will be placed to take questions. The federal framework for suicide prevention was put in place in 2016. Its mission, and I quote, is to prevent suicide in Canada. Since the framework was established, the suicide rate in Canada has not meaningfully changed. There was the slightest of decreases in 2020, which witnesses and experts attributed to pandemic related supports, but it has otherwise remained stubbornly steady. And we wanted to know why. The federal framework is after all a document full of laudable language and praiseworthy goals. It aims to prevent suicide through partnership, collaboration, and innovation. It aims to do so while respecting the diversity of cultures and communities that are touched by the issue. It speaks of building hope and resilience and of levering, leveraging partnerships. Heartwarming, yes. Inspiring, yes. But sadly, ineffectual. The evidence we heard is that fine words, perhaps unsurprisingly, have no effect on health outcomes for people in crisis. As we note in our conclusion, the framework is centered around ideas of what feels good instead of seeking out what actually works. Fortunately, the federal government has expressed a willingness to revise the framework. Caroline Bennett, Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, said work is already underway on revising the framework with publications expected in the fall. A major part of our study was identifying measures that should be and must be included in the updated version. With that, I am going to invite Senator Kutcher to provide some remarks regarding where the federal framework should direct its efforts to create a suicide prevention that actually prevents suicide. Thank you, Senator Kutcher. Thank you, Senator Omidvar. Thank you, Senator Omidvar. Friends, the status quo is not working. 
the suicide rate in Canada is not falling. Deaths, many preventable deaths are still taking place. I don't question the government's good intentions in putting the framework in place, but good intentions are certainly simply not enough. We need to pursue means of suicide prevention that are known to actually work, that have demonstrated significant, substantive, and sustained decreases in rates of suicide in all of Canada. Both public health and clinical interventions need to be concurrently applied using best available evidence for suicide rates to decrease. In the public health realm, means restriction, limiting access to lethal means, is the most effective suicide prevention that we have good evidence for. Means restriction aims to make the most common and lethal methods of suicide more difficult to apply. Suicide barriers are one example of this. For example, Toronto has a viaduct over the city's Don Valley that became infamous for many jumping deaths. In 2003, the city installed barriers on either side in the hope of saving lives. A British Medical Association publication compared data from 11 years before the installation of the barriers with data from 11 years after the installation. They found that suicides had declined from nine deaths per year to less than one death per year, and crucially, they found there was no associated increase in suicide by other means. Another potential focus is providing better direction related to the use of guns. Canadian data show that about 70% of all firearms deaths are suicides, not homicides, suicides. On average, about 550 deaths per year between 2016 and 2020, mostly men and often in rural Canada. One reason means restriction works is that many suicide attempts are driven by intense emotional states that occur during a short-term crisis. Anything that we can do to make self-harm that much more difficult during these intense but short-lived periods of time offers a meaningful opportunity at prevention. There are a number of public health measures that we know are effective. Our suicide prevention framework must highlight and promote such interventions. That's one of our most important recommendations, that the framework identify, promote, distribute, and support best available evidence-based measures. We also heard testimony that clinical interventions could be improved so that people at higher risk of suicide can be identified and better helped. Data from the United States showed that people who die by suicide interact with primary care physicians and other doctors concerned with physical health at twice the rate than with psychiatrists or mental health professionals. This suggested suicide prevention training for primary care physicians and primary care providers of all stripes with regular refresher courses would help drive down suicide rates. We also need to identify and limit the utilization of glossily marketed revenue generating suicide prevention programs that have not been demonstrated to be effective at decreasing rates of suicide. We recommend that the minister initiate an independent critical review of revenue generating suicide prevention pr interventions to determine which, if any, meet the evidence threshold of demonstrating that when they are applied, that they actually prevent suicide. Additionally, if we are going to support best available evidence-based interventions, we need to make sure that we have the solid evidence to be able to help make those decisions. Research and data collection and barrier-free dissemination of best available interventions are absolutely essential, and the framework must reflect that. Suicide prevention is not a one-size-fits-all approach. We need a better idea of the populations at risk, the individuals at risk, and what methods are most effective in helping which people. They're not all the same. They have to be tailored to the needs of the particular population. 
That's why we're recommending that the federal government work with the provinces, territories, and civil society organizations to create a national database on suicide, standardize coroner's reports, and improve the collection of demographic data. We also recognize that suicide prevention is not just a federal responsibility. Provinces, territories, and municipalities are all part of the solution. And we hope that our framework will be read by provinces, territories, and municipalities, and can be used to improve their own approaches to suicide prevention. Senator Brazo will now address the importance of the issues related to specific populations and data in particular. So thank you very much, Senator Brazo. Well, thank you very much, merci and uh, miigwech. Um, first off, I would like to uh, thank my colleagues present here uh, for the work that you have done on, on this uh, very uh, difficult but very important um, issue and uh, also to those of my colleagues who are not uh, here present. Um, donc, notre rapport s'appelle « Se laisser guider par les résultats ». Il aurait tout aussi bien pu s'intituler « Se laisser guider par n'importe quoi ». Parce que le cadre fédéral de prévention du suicide échoue sur le seul critère qui compte, les vies sauvées. Le cadre a été mis en place en 2016. Sa mission, et je cite, est de prévenir le suicide au Canada. Par contre, depuis la mise en place du cadre, le taux de suicide au Canada n'a pas vraiment changé. C'est un échec total. Il faut être clair. Son échec n'est pas une question de statistiques ou de lignes abstraites sur un graphique. Il s'agit de vies humaines, de familles irrémédiablement brisées, de potentiels non atteints, de désespoir ignoré. Chaque suicide peut être évité. Le seul nombre acceptable de suicides au Canada est zéro. Nous ne devons jamais perdre ça de vue. C'est pourquoi nous formulons autant de recommandations concrètes à la ministre de la Santé mentale et de dépendance qui devrait publier un cadre revisé à l'automne. So who are the people behind the numbers? Overwhelmingly, they are men. Overwhelmingly, they are indigenous. Men and boys account for more than 75% of suicides in Canada. We need to mobilize resources to steer them away from making that final fatal choice. And we need to understand what makes them so vulnerable. Indigenous peoples are also more likely to die by suicide, although there is considerable variation depending on who and where they are. The reality for First Nations, Métis and Inuit, is different, for example. The reality for Indigenous people living on reserve compared to those living in urban and rural areas is different. The suicide rates for Inuit in particular are at anywhere from six to 25 times the national rate. And Canada is home to some of the biggest suicide rates in the world. This in itself is scandalous. That this has persisted, has made me question whether the federal government is truly in interested in saving Indigenous lives. As Inuit leader Nathan Obed told our committee, there is nothing intrinsic to Inuit that makes them at high risk of suicide. But the poisonous byproducts of colonialism, like inadequate housing, substance abuse, and cultural erosion remain potent. This suggests that suicide prevention is a far larger problem than simply helping people through a crisis. We must also support interventions that could prevent people from reaching a crisis point in the first place. Les Autochtones sont également plus susceptibles de mourir par suicide, bien qu'il y ait des variations considérables en fonction de l'identité et de l'endroit où ils se trouvent. La, ré la réalité des Premières Nations et des Métis et des Inuits est différente, par exemple. La réalité des Autochtones qui vivent dans les réserves est différente de celle des Autochtones vivant dans des zones urbaines et rurales. Le taux de suicide sur les, chez les Inuits en particulier est de 6 à 25 fois supérieur au taux national. En soi, ceci est scandaleux. Il s'agit d'un enjeu très important pour moi. J'ai tenté de mettre fin à mes jours à deux reprises. Je souffrais 
j'avais renoncé à tout et à tous ceux qui m'entouraient. Et pourtant, <rire> j'ai eu de la chance. Mes amis et ma famille ont joué un rôle crucial dans mon rétablissement. Un chirurgien attentionné a pris le temps de me parler avec humanité et m'a conseillé de me faire soigner. Tout le monde n'a pas la, la, la chance de bénéficier d'un tel soutien. Alors, comment pouvons-nous donner de l'espoir à quelqu'un qui est seul ou qui se sent seul au monde? Like I just said, this is a very personal issue for me, as I have tried to take my life twice. I was hurting, I had given up on everything and everyone around me. But yet, I was fortunate, and I'm fortunate to be here today. And I'd like to say, especially to my dad and my brothers <clears throat> who played a very crucial role in me still being here. Taking aim at addiction is another example of an intervention that could keep people from reaching a crisis point. Substance use and addiction are incredibly damaging. I know this from personal experience. I have been sober for three years, and it's not easy. I drank to kill the pain I felt. One of our witnesses likened drug-related overdose deaths to slow-motion suicide. We need to better understand the efforts of substance abuse and addictions on suicides in Canada. Donc, s'attaquer à la toxicomanie est un autre, est un autre euh, exemple d'intervention qui pourrait empêcher les gens d'atteindre un point de crise. La consommation de substances psychoactives et la dépendance sont extrêmement préjudiciables. Et je sais ça par expérience personnelle. Je suis sobre depuis trois ans et ce n'est pas toujours facile. Je consommais de l'alcool pour tuer la, la douleur que je ressentais. L'une de nos témoins a comparé le décès par surdose à un suicide au ralenti. Nous devons mieux comprendre les effets de la consommation de substances et de dépendance sur les suicides au Canada. Donc, cela conclut mes remarques préliminaires. Nous vous remercions de votre attention et nous serons très heureux de prendre euh, vos questions. Merci. OK, we'll turn to questions in the room. Uh, Fraser Needham, 8PTN. <coughs> um, as for Senator Brazo, I guess this is what the report is talking about, is how you know, evidence-based sort of methods to help people prevent um, or suicide prevention. What, uh, what do you think might have helped you? Obviously, you, you came out of it on, on your own. But what might have helped you, I, I suppose, uh, in your situation that uh, maybe was not there uh, that, the, that governments could uh, look at? Well, thank you for the question. And um, let me just say, uh, you know, once um, after uh, my, my second suicide attempt in 2016, that's where I, I decided to, to take my, my life, um, uh, you know, uh, under control or try to. Um, and I started doing my own personal research on what programs uh, existed uh, out there for, for men, because in my personal research, I, you know, obviously 75% of Uh, suicides are, 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 are done so by men, and so how do we reduce this number? And so uh, my, my office in 2018-2019 did some extensive research on existing programs, and to make a long story short, um, they're, they're compared to, to women, for example, who are in, in crisis or in trouble, uh, there are more uh, programs that exist for women than men across Canada. And so this is why in this report, It will be important for the federal government going forward to put a, a gender-based lens on men when we are talking about uh, suicide because the facts are there, the facts don't lie. Three, three out of every four suicides are committed uh, by men and so we have to tackle, uh, you know, we have to look at uh, better programs uh, that, that, you know, will be created for the benefit of men going forward. And this next question is for any of the panel members, but um, I think uh, most of us know that we have a public health care system that has challenges, but um, on point of entry, if it's a physical ailment and that we still, you, if you go into the hospital, you likely will get some sort of care at uh, some point. Um, 
this is not the case for mental health issues. Um, I, everybody knows or has read in the paper, probably knows somebody that has went into a hospital with a mental health crisis, only to be turned away and uh, maybe later commit suicide. And this being the first point of entry for many people, it, it just seems that uh, governments, uh, whatever their stripe is, just have talked a lot about uh, suicide prevention, mental health, but when it comes to putting the money into it, uh, for example, hospitals, even in, in everywhere, just do not have uh, often the psychiatric staff, social workers on staff, even uh, during night. Um, wh what do you propose? Do you see anything changing, I guess, until governments uh, that spend the money in this area of health care rather than just talking about it, I suppose? I think that Butcher is best qualified to answer that question, but I will point you to the report under recommendation two where we do identify local public health initiatives as, as one part of a very big solution. Um, if in every mental health sit, uh, situation, crisis situation, the police is summoned as opposed to public health, then the outcomes, I think, will be co are, are, diff are different. Senator Kutcher. Well, yes, th thank you, Senator Moore, and thank you very much for that, uh, that question. I think that uh, your concern is shared by us, and I think is shared by pretty well every Canadian. The challenge that we have had, frankly, is that when I graduated medical school in the 70s, our biggest mental health challenge was providing rapid access to effective care for people when they needed it. It still remains our biggest challenge. So we have dropped the ball over and over and over again, regardless of which government, which political party, which stripe. The World Health Organization, for example, recommends 10 to 12 percent of the annually recurring health care budget be spent on mental health. There are no provinces or territories in Canada that I know of that reach that threshold. And so you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. You have to actually invest in what we know works, not investing in things that we know don't work or that we don't know if they work. If it's the latter, then let's study it as we put things into place, and that's a very good public health approach. On the public health side, we know that means restriction works. Study after study, country after country, shows that restricting access to lethal means decreases rates of suicide. And as Senator Brazo has said, in men, it's access to lethal means. Men use lethal means more often when they are suicidal compared to women. So it's access to guns, it's jumping from heights, it's hanging. Those are the preferred methods for suicide by men. They lead to a higher proportion of deaths. We know that in public health. We've known that for decades. On the clinical side, you're absolutely correct. There are resources that should be put into every single primary care practice in this country. Availability for counselors and mental health care in every single primary care practice should be sine qua non, period. Everybody should have it. So that is rapid access to effective care, and that can actually decrease rates of suicide. The other point is that you made is exceedingly well taken. The aftercare of people who are treated in high intensity psychiatric services like hospitals or emergency rooms can be substantively improved by changing the way we deliver aftercare. Let, let me go out on a limb here. There is no way in this country with our abundant resources that an individual who is actively suicidal or who has just been discharged from hospital with psychiatric care should be waiting months, weeks, or even many days for their follow-up appointments. That is just unconscionable. And we don't actually need to change huge systems to change that. So our report looks at both the public health measures that can work and at the clinical measures that can work. Some of those clinical measures we can put into place now at very, very little cost. Some of those clinical measures will require additional investment, but I would argue that our investment has been well below what it should be, and it hasn't always been directed to where the need is the greatest. 
So that's what I would suggest we focus on now. Okay, Melanie Glan, CBC. Hi, it's uh, Melanie Glantz from CBC. I just wanted to ask, you've mentioned a few times about the rate of men being uh, higher than women, but I'm actually working on a story today about young girl adolescents age 10 to 14 uh, surpassing boys at that age when it comes to suicide. I'm wondering if you're aware of this research recently published and also what your thoughts are about what might be happening to young girls in, in Canada? That question, I'm looking to uh, my colleagues. That research is not what we, we have seen, so it's new to us. We can certainly take a look at it. Um, and if there are emerging trends in populations that we need to pay attention to, then the report actually recommends exactly that. Put the money where the problem is. Don't put it in sort of a general, generic way. And if this research points us to a, to a di direction that is that we have, we have overlooked in this report, partly because we didn't have that research, uh, we will certainly pay attention to it. Senator Kutcher. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for that really excellent question. And I would f start off by echoing uh, what Senator Omidvar has just said, uh, that our report uh, identifies the reality of focusing on where need is great, uh, and as Senator Brazo has said, on where need is greatest first. Uh, I am aware of that research. I am aware of research prior to that as well, uh, uh, suggesting similar uh, uh, changes. Uh, uh, and I don't want to mix up my professional psychiatrist role with my role as a senator here. But uh, there are many uh, hypotheses around why that might be occurring. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, it behooves us to explore each of those hypotheses very, very carefully. Whether those hypotheses are uh, correct or not, uh, it's the, the study that will, will, will help us with that. Some of them, as you I'm sure know, having researched this area, is the effect of social media on girls, which is very different than the effect of social media on boys. The availability of uh, uh, online channels, uh, such as through TikTok, which actually promotes suicidal ideation, suicidal activity. Uh, and there are a host of other factors uh, which uh, people are actively researching now. And I think that this is a really wonderful opportunity for Canada to actually say, look, we have these issues related to suicide prevention, and as I have to echo Senator Brazo here, where the need is greatest, let's make sure that we invest in research that clarifies what will work best for whom. And, and I, I would think, I would hope that you would consider uh, uh, thinking about that for your story, because it's one thing to have hypotheses and ideas why something might be happening. It's another thing to have some certainty that uh, Senator Brazo has pointed out is data-driven. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed a follow-up question. I, d I don't actually have your report in front of me, but are young girls and boys referred to in this report, do you break it down by age and what the recommendations are for younger people versus adults? We did determine in our study that men account for 75% of the approximate 4,500 suicides uh, that take place each year. We found that the suicide rate for Inuit is particularly and alarmingly high at roughly 6 to 25 times the national rate for the First Nation and Métis people are also overrepresented. We were also informed that within the category of male suicides within the indigenous population, it is young boys who seem to be most vulnerable. I'll uh, maybe turn to Senator Prazo to uh, provide further evidence. Well, I would just add that um, in terms of the um, the experts that we, uh, the, the expert testimony that we heard, uh, we heard that the suicide rates in Canada has basically not uh, increased uh, or moved significantly in the last 10, 20 years. 
But having said that, if we were to take only the statistics uh, with respect to ind the indigenous populations and suicide in Canada, if, 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 if those were non-indigenous peoples, it would be labeled a crisis. But because indigenous data in terms of suicide is all lumped in the pan-Canadian data, uh, well, governments are basically telling us, well, there's nothing to see here. Uh, you know, rates are not going down, but they're not going up, so we must be doing something right. But if we were just to take out the, the data of indigenous suicides in Canada, it would be a crisis, and it is a crisis, and we can never lose sight of that. Uh, that one of the report's uh, recommendations is the creation of a national database on suicide, including indicators such as suicide rate, number of emergency room visits, uh, effective suicide prevention programs, and uh, so on. One of the things we are not able to accurately gather evidence on, and I'm sitting next to a scientist, is the reports from coroners. These are provincial, they're not standardized, we don't actually know how many people committed suicide or attempted to commit suicide through which means, because these are not standardized. Uh, and, they do, and we're not able to collect uh, sufficient demographic and geographic data for disaggregated analysts. So therefore, to Senator Kutcher's point, we need to collaborate with provincial and territorial authorities on making suicide and suicide attempts, incidents reportable to the sp specific authority in a standardized way. I know that's asking a lot of Canada uh, on health matters, but I think the, 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 uh, the, this point needs to be underlined. Fakia Baig, Canadian Press. Hi, good morning. Um, I joined a little late because of a prior commitment, so sorry if, I've, if you've already been asked this question, but I was wondering if either of you can talk a little bit about why the, how the idea to investigate this issue came about. I'm going to ask Senator Kutcher to answer that question because he was the driving force behind, behind this report. Well, thank you very much for that question, and I want to acknowledge the work that Senator Brazo has been doing on this file. Uh, and uh, we actually met a number of times and talked about various issues that uh, were important for all of us to, to address. Um, and so uh, the motion was tabled in the Senate to have the committee study this. And uh, Senator Brazo, who is not a member of our committee, kindly joined the committee and, and provided tremendous uh, uh, insight and helped uh, direct what we did. So I just want to make that very public acknowledgement. Uh, I'll tell you what, what uh, drove me here, um, complete frustration. I have been a practicing psychiatrist my professional career. And over and over and over and over and over again, we have tried to help health systems apply things that work. So doing something is not the same as doing the right thing. So from a professional perspective, it was very frustrating to see healthcare systems, whether they be federal, provincial, or territorial, focus attention and investment on things that made people feel good and not on things that actually decreased rates of suicide. We need to make sure that our suicide prevention efforts aren't based on us feeling good, but based on what we do doing good. On a personal side, I have had the professional privilege of sitting with families who've lost a child to suicide. And I can tell you that this must be one of the most devastating situation any human being is ever in. And they would ask the question, why? And we don't have the answer to why. And then they would ask, why not? Why are you not doing what we know works? And then we would share that with the frustration. 
And I'll end this response with another more personal note. My beloved uncle died of suicide. Professional, top of his game, businessman, highly, highly, highly successful. Developed a clinical depression. He was living in a city far from me. I hadn't seen him for many, many, many months. He sought assistance from his church. He was told that he had lost his faith and needed to regain his faith. He went to his family physician, just like the data tells us. The family physician said, well, you're just feeling low for a while. Things will get better. He was a senior, senior person in his workplace. He went to the workplace and he shut himself in his office and stay there all day and then go home. Nobody, nobody in the workplace identified that he was having such substantive problems. And probably because he was senior, nobody stepped in to say something. He lived with his wife my aunt, a lovely, lovely woman, nurturing, caring. She had no idea what he was going through. She did know nothing about depression. She was not mentally health literate. That tragedy tore our family apart. It was exceedingly, exceedingly difficult, and I, for the first time, realized what many of the other families that I had theoretically understood we're living because I was living it myself. And when I look back at his journey to his ultimate death, I could see at every step of the way where somebody who had understood what was necessary could easily have intervened, whether that was the minister at his church, whether that was the physician that he went to see, whether that it was his wife who was mentally health literate and understood these things. Every single one of those steps, whether it was that in the workplace where people recognized that he was struggling and had the courage to step up and say something. So, you know, there is a lot that we can do. And what I would really like to see is the federal government moving ahead to ensure that those kind of tragedies don't happen because they don't need to happen. Did you have a follow-up? Thank you, Senator. Thank you so much for sharing that difficult story. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, are either of you, and I'm sorry again if you've been asked this already, um, can either of you maybe talk a little bit about something that really surprised you um, through the investigation process? I, I'll, I'll go first. What really surprised me was, was the evidence. The evidence really surprised me uh, that, that uh, suicide rates, A, are not falling, and then the significant over-representation over of Indigenous men and boys in that evidence surprised me. And if I may, um, uh, what, what, <laughs> what um, kind of surprised me is that uh, there was uh, an acceptance uh, to, to uh, have a gender-based uh, analysis, gender-based plus analysis, um, you know, because usually when we talk about gender-based analysis, it's usually um, for the benefit of, of, uh, of our girls and women. Uh, but in talking about suicide, and, and again, I, I go back to the 75% of suicides that are committed by men, um, you know, it's, it's time that we start talking about men's mental health in Canada. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about suicide today, but we have to talk about the need for men's mental health because if we focus on men's mental health, it means that uh, children will be better, means that relationships will be healthier, means that families may be more intact and together. Uh, but we, we have to focus this because uh, I feel that uh, 
men um, have gone uh, uh, through a lot uh, in the last uh, generation um, in particular. Uh, and perhaps there's a lot of men out there who are questioning their own role in society. And so, uh, you know, there, there's a wide variety of issues, but it certainly surprised me that, um, that uh, there was uh, immediate buy-in to have a gender-based analysis plus on uh, when, when talking about uh, suicide prevention. Okay, seeing no other questions, I think we can conclude the Q&A portion of this press conference and thank you to our speakers and to uh, the media in the room and on the call. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Spain and Pat.